All right. So my name is Lauren Cohen. I'm the L.E. Simmons Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School. Uh, I have a joint appointment in both the Finance and Entrepreneurship Unit there, uh, and I'm a Research Associate at the MBER. So I want to thank you very much for inviting me to present at this conference. I'm really looking forward to sharing these ideas with you guys, and, and hopefully you'll have some feedback for me. And so if you do, please email it to me. I put my email address here. I'd love to chat with you both about this research and anything you're working on that's related. So with that, I'm gonna get started. So this is a joint project with Umit Gurun of the University of Texas at Dallas and Kwak Nigun from DePaul University. And its title is the ESG Innovation Disconnect, Evidence from Green Patenting. Now, the idea behind this paper is quite simple. And it's just this idea of looking a little deeper into ESG investing. And in particular, as of 2019, sustainable investing represents more than 20% of the $46 trillion asset management market in the US. And compared to 2015, right, less than five years ago, that represents a 40% jump. Now, a large contributor to this growth was the 2015 guidance issued by the DOL, which allowed fiduciaries to incorporate these ESG factors into investment decisions. And the implementation of ESG is often done by either avoiding certain categories altogether, right, like tobacco, weapons, or fossil fuels, and we're gonna be focusing on that in the presentation, um, or just embracing certain other industries, such as local economic industries, clean tech, or the environment. Now look, there are some good arguments for ESG investing, right? So the first is preferences. Maybe investors are willing to sacrifice an amount of risk-adjusted return in order to allow the fund to achieve returns with aligned ESG focus, right? Or alternatively, they're willing to pay more for a fund that promises the same ex-ante risk-adjusted return while delivering aligned ESG investment, right? Either way, investors have their eyes wide open and they say, look, I know that my take-home return is gonna be lower, but I'm totally cool with that because I get some utils, some return in terms of doing that with this ESG focus. Now, secondly, it could be a belief-based explanation. And that is a micro-founded based explanation that ESG investing actually could be a dominant form of investing for a number of reasons. For instance, you could say maybe it's customers, right? If I think that customers value ESG policies and products, even if I don't as the investor, then I think that perhaps their demand today and maybe future demand will skew toward ESG products and firms that produce ESG products. So I wanna focus on those strategically in my portfolio. And in the same way, another factor of production might be on the employee side, right? I say, hey, human capital wise, if I think employees are otherwise, uh, all else equal, want to go to firms that focus on ESG related factors, then these firms that focus on ESG might get the best employees. And if they have the best L, then maybe they have a better production function. And so they do better in the long run. And I wanna invest strategically based on that, right? Now, the opposite view is that this ESG investing, right, either whether it's based on just totally avoiding some category or downweighting it, that's a constrained maximization, right? What we know in economics is that these constrained maximizations are bounded to be at least as good and, and usually worse than the unconstrained maximization, right? And there we would expect this unconstrained maximization to then produce uh, inferior risk return trade-offs. Now, look, what is the realized performance of these? Well, the academic evidence on this is mixed, okay? So some funds find that there's maybe a little bit, a lot of, of these findings find that there's not much, but the truth matter is they don't have much power because it just hasn't been around long enough in order to estimate these facts. Now, um, in terms of the effect on firm behavior, there's also some evidence, but again, it kind of goes in both directions. So given this, our understanding of whether ESG investment flows impact innovation, um, which can help us solve environmental problems, it's just incomplete. And so that's where we step in in this paper. And so what we're gonna do is we are gonna look at who produces green patents or innovation that help address climate change and other environmental challenges and who are the most influential green patent producers, right? And then we're gonna say, hey, look, if that's who's producing this stuff, then is money following that, right? Is capital following and kind of responding to who's producing these ESG innovations to the largest degree? Um, and that's really the simple motivation, and that's what we're going to do. And so I'm going to tell you already what we find, and I'm just going to go through in detail how we find it. So 
Finding number one, look, a large fraction of the recent green patenting isn't driven by highly rated ESG firms, right? But instead, it's firms that are commonly favored by ESG funds aren't the ones who are producing this green innovation. That green innovation is coming from firms that are often explicitly excluded from ESG-based fund investment universes and that are the focus of divestiture campaigns. In particular, the energy sector has a large and actually growing percentage of the entirety of their patent activity dedicated to green research. Now, energy firms allocate significantly more of their innovation efforts towards green innovation um, and more than other firms, okay? So they allocate significantly more than highly rated ESG firms to green innovation in particular, green patenting, and significantly more than other sectors that in aggregate are large green patent producers, right? Which is to say that there are other firms out there that are producing a lot of green patents, but in percentage terms, these energy firms are focusing more of their innovative efforts in terms of patenting on green patents and green innovation. Um, not only are they focusing more of their efforts on these green patents, but they're producing better green patents. Okay, the green patents of energy producing firms are significantly higher quality by the quality markers that we have. So in terms of them being more highly cited and them being more likely to be blockbuster patents, which are those patents really on the right, right tail of the distribution, the patent distribution, like many things is a skewed distribution. And so it really is those ones in the right tail that have the most impact and energy firms produce more of those as well. Um, and we're also gonna see they're big important players in lots of these landmark innovations within the alternative energy space that have happened really over the last 50 years, okay? These energy firms with that as a backdrop are often, like we said, excluded from ESG funds and they're the targets of many divestiture campaigns. So we're gonna show you that this is exactly what these mutual funds do, right? We'll show you that empirically, although that, that kind of makes sense just by thinking through it and what you've probably seen out there. Um, and on the intensive margin, energy firms even get less credit in terms of incremental ESG score for each higher quality green patent that they produce, okay? So we actually measure at the firm level when you produce another green patent, how much reward do you get from these ESG services? And it turns out these energy firms get significantly less credit, okay? Let me tell you a little about the data and then I'm gonna jump in to what we find, again, explaining those findings in more detail and then tell you where we're going, okay? So where, where does our sample come from? Well, part of it comes from the USPTO. We use two large data sets that capture the complete universe of patents from 2008 through 2017 in order to identify the universe of green patenting activity, okay? And so that's both patent citation and assignment databases. Moreover, for each of our analysis on firm characteristics, um, we use some external data on those firm characteristics from these public firm databases. And we use ESG ranking data from Sustainalytics ESG rankings post-2008. Now look, why do we use Sustainalytics? There are a number of these providers. Well, it has the largest sample going back the longest time. So we get the longest time series and the broadest cross-section, that's why we used it, but it'd be the best in terms of power. Um, we're also collecting other ESG data sources in order to uh, check those as well. And so look, what are green patents? And so the nice thing is we have some markers and we have some guidance in order to do this. So we follow the guidelines of the OECD uh, that they created in order to tackle exactly this problem, okay? And so patents that are related to environmental technologies are classified into these various subcategories of green patents. And so you'll see one here, this has to do with climate change mitigation technology. And even within that, there are these subcategories, right? So this looks very much like um, an, an industry classification, right? Either SIC codes or NAICS, or even like a Dewey Decimal System for classifying these patents. And what are these green patents? Well, I'm showing you here a patent that is now over 40 years old, it's about 45 years old. And this is a patent from Exxon. And what is this patent on? Well, you can see it's a patent on a solar cell module, okay? So it turns out Exxon was one of the first patenters in this space of solar technology. And not only were they one of the first, but this is one of the most influential patents that really laid the groundwork for a lot of the technology that we use in solar today. 
And just to give you an idea of how this has evolved over time, so this graph goes back to 1980, and you can see that this increase has been happening ever since. And when we separate this into industries, interestingly enough, like we mentioned, like you kind of see with that Exxon patent, energy firms happen to also be some of the first entrants into this space. Okay, so back in the early 1980s, they were really some of the first movers into this green patent. If we then just list the top 50 green patenters, I highlight in yellow here, those green patenters, which are energy firms. And so you can see they pop up quite often. So we have Exxon, we have Royal Dutch Shell, we have BP, Chevron, US Oil. They all pop up in these top 50 green patent producers. And not only that, but that energy industry is second behind manufacturing in terms of the number of total green patents produced. And so now jumping into the results, now look, I already mentioned this. Here, I'm just gonna, to regress on the left-hand side, the industry green patent ratio. So this is at the industry year level. And so I put the industry on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we have uh, the percentage go of that industry, this is gonna show, that goes into green patenting, okay? So we have the industry green patent ratio on the left-hand side. And then that first variable, the energy sector, which is our variable of interest, just measures how much more this sector does than the average sector, controlling for lots of different sector characteristics, okay? And so what is that? You can see those coefficients there around 13% here. What does that 13% mean? Well, it implies that the energy sector is nearly three times the relative focus on green patenting than the average industry. The average industry here is around 8-ish percent, whereas the energy industry has 22% of all of its patents going in to this green patenting space, okay, and dedicated to that green patenting space. Now, what's kind of interesting is that if we focus within the green patenting space, like I said, the OECD has all of these different classifications for green patents. If we focus just on climate mitigation technology, we can see that the same pattern arises, which is to say that this energy industry also has about three times the focus on climate mitigation technology in particular than any other industries, right? You might've said, well, look, maybe these oil firms, they're producing these green patents, but they're just doing it to like blow smoke at everyone to say, yeah, yeah, we're doing green patents, but they're not really green patents that help in terms of pushing forward climate mitigation. And that's just not true, right? We see the same patterns here, which is to say that they're patenting specifically in climate mitigation technology. Right? And we then look at the impacts on and the correlations of these green patents with environmental score. Now, that first column right, just says that green patents weirdly have a negative correlation with environmental score. Right? And that seems odd because you might think, gosh, it seems like industries that have an environmental score that's higher, we would expect to have more green patents. So we would think that that would be a positive correlation. Okay, but it's negative. And so what's going on here? Well, what's going on here is this. We see that the energy sector is significant and positive when it comes to green patents. So they produce significantly more green patents. So they're over three times likely again for green patents to come from these high energy uh, firms. But these firms that are in top three sector energy producers they're actually less likely to produce green patents. And why do we see less likely to produce green patents? What does that mean? Well, it means that they produce a lot of green patenting. They're just even more active in other patenting than they are in green patenting, which is to say that on the absolute front, they're producing a lot of green patents, but they're just producing a lot of patents altogether. And so when you see one of these green patents, it's actually less likely to come from one of these. Okay. And in fact, what we're going to show in the next table is that that entire negative correlation that you see between environmental score and green patents, that all comes from energy firms. So if you take energy firms out of there, then it switches to positive. Okay. And that's what you're going to see here. Okay. And so this, what we see here is that these energy firms, so on the left-hand side, this environmental score. And so what we see is that energy firms on average don't have a great environmental score. Okay, so they score a little bit lower, but that's not surprising. Okay, but what is kind of interesting is that they don't get rewarded for their green patents. Okay, and so in general, other firms, 
they get rewarded for green patents, and yet energy firms don't. Okay, they have significantly lower rewards, and in fact, goes in point estimate to negative when you interact the energy sector with these number of green patents granted. And we see something very similar when we look at number of green patent applications or green patent citations. And when we run the exact same test for other top producers of green patents, we see the opposite effect, right? Which is to say that the top three sectors outside of energy, right? They have higher environmental scores on average, but not only that, they do get credit for their green patents, right? When they produce more green patents, they get a higher environmental score, right? And so they get the same action, right? So, so Exxon and one of these other firms comes with a patent to the USPTO and these ESG rating firms say, oh, this is wonderful. You have this new patent to firms that aren't in the energy industry, the energy firms who are doing the same thing, they're saying, ah, nah, forget about it. And it even kind of goes in the other direction, okay? Why is that gonna be so perplexing? Because we're about to show that these patents that Exxon are coming with turn out to be ex post more influential patents, okay? Higher quality patents by most measures, okay? And so how do we measure that? Well, we measure that using two markers. First is just raw citations. This is the simplest thing we could do is just look at how many citations after the fact that the green patents of energy sector firms get relative to the green patents of all other firms. And it turns out they get about 9% more citations on average, controlling for lots of other firm characteristics than green patents of other, all other firms and all other industries, okay? And it's highly significant. And not only that, but we see that on that blockbuster margin too. So there's some evidence that citations alone can be a really noisy measure of quality. And yet what's a really good measure of quality is this blockbuster status. So because it's such a skewed distribution, it turns out that those patents that are above the 90th, 95th percentile, those are the ones that really seem to have impact, right? And have exponentially more citations um, and seem to, to really lead to follow on products and research in the future in a real sense. And it turns out energy sector patents are also significantly more likely to be these blockbuster patents. Okay, and yet when we do the exact same thing for these other top three sector energy, uh, top three sectors, sorry, of green patents outside of energy, right? So these are, again, these are sectors that are producing a lot of green patents, but they're not the energy sector. We see the opposite, that on average, they're a bit lower quality in terms of their citations and in terms of their probability of being blockbuster patents. Okay, and now turning to this capital market response. So what have we seen so far? So we've seen that these, these energy sector firms, they're large producers of green patents in an absolute sense. They're large producers in a percentage sense, which is that they're spending more of their innovation share, more of that patent share focused on green energy and all those patents they're producing on average are higher quality. Okay, so they're producing more green patents and higher quality green patents. And so how are capital markets responding? Well, this is a first hint. And so what we see here is these funds that are focused on this green technology, they significantly uh, downweight these energy firms. Okay, so they hold significantly less of these energy firms. Uh, they are more likely to hold zero, right? Absolutely nothing. And they're more likely to underweight them in their holdings, right? Relative to any index weighting of these energy firms. And again, the complete opposite is true of the other top green patent producers, right? So this has nothing to do with producing a lot of green patents. So these funds deal very differently with green patent producers that are energy and that aren't energy, right? And we see that no matter how you measure these capital market provisions. So look, stepping back, what have we found so far? So we find consistent and robust markers that both the quantity and quality of green patenting is higher for energy firms. Now, paradoxically, these firms are precisely those that capital is often restricted from by either mandates and, or campaigns that have directives to solve important problems in green innovation. Okay, our analysis thus suggests there's a perhaps surprisingly negative relationship between the generators 
of innovation that could help us confront this really important problem and these environmental challenges that we have and where capital is being allocated to try to solve the problem. That said, there is still work to be done on whether capital allocation indeed follows ESG scores and to what extent ESG score motivated investment can be calibrated to achieve better capital allocation. We believe that investigation into these issues is gonna provide critical insights into the shifting landscape of innovation, allowing us to capture and assess the full welfare impact of this ESG capital and this growing ESG capital base on the global economy. Um, moreover, our findings raise, I think, important questions as to whether the current exclusions of many ESG-focused policies, um, along with these divestiture campaigns that we see uh, happening in an increasing rate across the world, are optimal, or whether a rewards-based incentive system would lead to more efficient, innovative outcomes, right? So the basic idea is that, look, rather than saying, hey, we need to solve this really important problem, these really important environmental challenges, and you guys can be a part of that, but you guys can't, right? Whether than ex ante saying that this group just can't help us and this group can, instead we could use a rewards-based system where we say, hey, look, we're gonna crowdsource all of the great ideas we can get and anyone can be a part of the solution. And we're gonna give rewards ex post to whoever comes up with better solutions, right? We think that's another way that the world could go about solving this problem and maybe a more efficient way to do it. Okay, so kind of starting or ending, I should say, where we began, this is a group of Exxon scientists who came up with that first solar cell technology. Okay, so they not only came up with a patent, but then produced based on that patent. And this is really where we want to go next. Okay, so we view the next steps in this research agenda for us are to tie these initial findings we have on patents to more of these measures of real activity of these energy firms. Um, and we've begun collecting data to do exactly that, right? And it's data specifically on alternative energy produced by the world's largest producers. And I'll tell you what we found so far. Okay, we have initial evidence that energy firms are large players in the alt energy space. And in particular, energy firms that produce more green patents produce significantly more alternative energy wattage worldwide. And not only that, but these energy firms are also involved in some of the largest and most high profile and significant offshore wind, solar, hydroelectric projects and other types of alternative energy projects, both purely private and then these private public partnerships also around the globe. Okay, and with that, I wanna thank you again for inviting me to give this paper. And I really am looking forward to all of your helpful feedback and suggestions and to hearing about what you're working on. Thanks very much.